Okay, investment investment expectations is the magic you know phrase of the day. Investment expectations for 2022. We're deep into it already here in Community Matters uh, with Richard Wertheim, and he is he is not a financial planner. He is something else. So, Richard, can you distinguish what I originally called you and what you really are? Yeah, I uh, a lot of people. Uh, understandably don't really see the difference. So we're, we're fund managers. We actually manage a portfolio. We build it. We do our research on individual positions. And then we, uh, uh, you know, so we, we're not, we don't help people plan their, their, their retirements or, um, uh, you know, we're the guys that are actually at the coal face creating the products. And then a financial planner may, may or may not use our products. We don't offer them. We may in the future, um, but it's it's uh, the distinction is we're not the middleman we're the we're the guys that are actually making and investing in about we're all about the returns uh, uh, less about uh, sort of um, a broker if you will and that, that's what I've done for my whole life so it's a it, it's a, a, a distinction I think particularly here in Hawaii that's lost on a lot of people um, because there aren't there's no fund management there's no institutional business here in Hawaii. Yeah, so that is something. You're you're like a mutual fund like that, aren't aren't you? It's I mean, so we're we're, we're you, can, you know they're just semantics. We are like a mutual fund, but we're more probably similar to we call ourselves multi strategy or a type of a hedge fund. Even though we're not really uh, that has the wrong connotations for what our investment objectives are, but it, these are just names. But yes, in, in a sense, we're a fund. That's what we are. Okay, I mean, so you, 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 we literally you know, are a fund. We're actually transitioning right now into a fund. So no more uh, individual accounts. Uh, so it's all it's run. It is a fund. It's called the Fort Street Asset Management Fund. Okay, no more individual accounts. Wow. I hope you continue to talk to me. Well, it depends. If you buy me lunch, I'm <laughs> <fine. laughs> would you take a virtual lunch? Never mind. <laughs> as long as it's sweet as long as it's sweet you, you get your pizza i get my pizza I can, anyway i can work with that i can work with that yeah no we still have some individual accounts we'll still have that capacity but really the focus is to have the 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 fund allows us to operate uh much more efficiently and it also allows us to enhance uh, or broaden our investment scope which is really important given the world that we're in today and and we talk about that. So our focus is really equities. We run a, a proprietary portfolio and that focus is because that's where my expertise is. But the world today is, is becoming more complicated. And I think you're going to have to uh, have more tools in your toolbox. And so that's what we're preparing for. Well, in the toolbox, in the magic box of tools, is there what is known affectionately as an algorithm? There could be. Um, there are all sorts of strategies out there. You know, it, it's there are a lot of different ways to skin a cat. Um, you know, it really depends on sort of first and foremost, what your objective is. And then second, what you understand and what you can get access to. So, yeah, I mean, some some strategies uh, use algorithms and it's not it's not an, uh, an area of expertise for me. But I've, I, I'm familiar with guys who run those strategies, having been in, you know around the fund management business for you know, 30 plus years. Um, and, you know, some of them are run very successfully. Uh, you know, some of them are black boxes. You have no idea how they do it, uh, but it is, it's fascinating. And if I were to talk to my younger self today, I would definitely, you know, have told myself to, to do more work on the quantitative side and less on the qualitative. But if you have that capacity, so yes. So there's, yeah, it could be, it's not, it's not a big area for me and for what we're looking to do less of a focus, but I'm open to anything. You know, there's, there's, it's, it's particularly in this world, um, having, uh, like I like to say these days, having as many or more arrows in your quiver uh, is better and not uh, riding on a one trick pony. Uh, sometimes that works, you know, and there, are, we've been in a phenomenally, phenomenal period of uh, incredible growth uh and and it's just it was just this is a goldilocks period that we're gonna look back on over the last 20 plus years and go oh my god that was that was fun and you, you were gonna have to the playbooks have to be adjusted yeah i mean i really like the idea of talking to your younger self but uh richard what about talking to your older self 
Uh, what about talking to the Richard Wertheimer of, say, two years from now? Wouldn't that be helpful? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> maybe, maybe two years from now. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, look, it's, I, I think when you making predictions about the markets uh, is uh, difficult and mostly a waste of time. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be thinking about where the world is going. So if you think about two years from now, I think that we have now crossed the Rubicon and we are in a different place. And inflation plays a big part in that. And that's, you know, uh, if, if we've heard a lot about it in the last year, I expect we're going to hear a lot more about it in the next few years. And um, that really changes the investment strategy for a lot of people. It's going to make bonds in particular very uh, unattractive. And many people, like, you know, I just, just a second ago, we were just talking before we got on the air, they're... They have a lot of bonds because in the old days, just holding bonds and getting a you know generating yield, it was easy, and they provided a hedge against equities. And you know, yes, that's worked over the last twenty plus years. But if you look back over a hundred plus year period, it wasn't always the case. It's more of an anomaly. And inflation is kryptonite to bonds, and so there's going to be a lot of people, you know, uh, struggling to find a home for their money. And there are alternatives. I mean, equities is the obvious one. Um, uh, even though we're in for a bumpy ride right now as the Fed tightens. Um, you know, I think, you know, the, 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 again, keeping it simple, owning equities and not trying to worry about the market so much. And if you can, and this is what we try to do is have a sensible portfolio, have great companies, hopefully you buy them at the right price or at a decent price. Uh, be in a position to be able to sustain any of the bad times because they always come. You don't know how long and don't touch it. I mean, the best thing to do is, you know, we, our, our, our strategy for the equity portfolio is quite simple, you know, find great companies, buy them at reasonable prices and be patient. Don't do anything. And that sounds easy, but it's really hard because what's a good price and what's a great company. Yeah. And, and what, and what changes would drive you to sell that company that looks so good before? Don't sell it. Don't sell. So that, that our strategy, and again, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. You talked about algorithms and quant funds, all different types of funds out there. And having, I, you know, in my, in my younger days, I was a trader. I was a proprietary trader. And I, literally, we would trade every day. It would be in and out of the markets, you know, trying to like, but, but that's a, you can make money doing that. But over the long run, it's really hard. And I think the, I looked at my own my own track record over the, the years. And that's how we created this, this fund is to protect our assets and to figure out a, a sensible way to compound them. And so selling, if you got a great company, why sell it? Just hold it. If it goes down more and you, you, you either hold it or you buy more at a, at yeah. a better price, you get excited if you, if you have that ability to do that. So, you know, the mistake that most of us make is we, we are too active. We feel like in investing, like we have to, if we don't do something, then we're not being productive. And it's the exact opposite. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I was um, in anticipation of this uh, discussion. I took a look at the website for CNBC, which, um, you know, at a time years ago, and I was more interested in the day to day ebb and flow in the market uh, was um, interesting to me. I haven't watched it in a while, but there was a there was a little piece there that was uh, that was really interesting. It was a fellow named Stephen Heller. Stephen mm -hmm. Heller used to be the Fed, I guess. Yes. Um, and he's criticizing the current Fed. He's saying that the current Fed um, should have raised rates a long time ago, and they just didn't have the cojones to do that, he said. He did not use the word cojones, by the way. I'll be clear about that. Um, he, said, he said they should have, and now they have to sort of catch up with the inflation. Do you agree? Yeah, I think that's probably true. Look, it's easy you know, to sit, sit back and be the... Um, uh, armchair quarterback with this stuff. It, you know, in, in, the Fed did a phenomenal job in, in terms of the pandemic. Uh, I don't think anybody would fault them for what they did. They, they, what they haven't done is even now, uh, on one hand, they're talking about tightening, which is great. They're behind the curve. They, they're, 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 they're starting too late, um, but they're still also loosening at the same time. So it, it, it's really hard though. I mean, the, the you know, I don't, uh, I, I do think they have to accelerate the pace of of uh of rate hikes and also start 
shrinking the balance sheet, which is, these are all tightening measures basically to, to, to basically soak up some of the excess liquidity. Um, and so Stephen Heller is absolutely right. I mean, a lot of people are saying this is not, and now the market is, is adjusting to that reality. And that's what you're seeing. Uh, you know, th th that plus we've had, you know, a very you mean, big, you uh, mean that volatile day a couple of days ago when it was all over the board, that was an adjustment to uh, the yeah. rate hike issue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, 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 you know, markets discounting Meg is trying to figure out what, uh, what this new information means and what it means for, for, uh, fund ultimately is about fundamentals of the economy and, and really what drives share prices is two things in particular. It's the earnings capability of the, of the, of, of companies in general, and then also their yield that they generate. So that, that's what, if, if you're the, the, and these things are all related, obviously, because, uh, it, when things are loose, the, the, the one mis misconception, I think by a lot of people is they, they have this sense because of the pandemic that the sky is falling and that, that things are really bad out there. And there are problems out there. I'm not trying to belittle that. There's very real issues. But from an economic point of view, the, the economy is red hot. I mean, the, that's why you have inflation. So when you have that kind of strength, it means that that a lot of companies' earnings are quite good. And that is ultimately what's driven the 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 stock market and stock prices over the last two years. Uh, that's what's happened. It's like what the Fed did was, I hate the word unprecedented, but it was historically, we've never seen anything with so much money and it's still out there. So it, it's, I wouldn't get too negative. I just think we're adjusting to this period where now the Fed realizes that they've built this, the mother of all bonfires, uh, threw on a bunch of rocket fuel. This is in March of 2020 started. Um, and lit it. And when they did that, we've said this is going to this is definitely going to set off some very uh, significant consequences. And we're seeing it now with inflation. And inflation is very tricky, you know, in terms of what it means for the economy and politically. And obviously, runaway inflation can have severe, you know, historically from a historical context. And I'm not suggesting that's going to happen. I think we're going to get waves of inflation. So inflation will rise, and then it'll kind of come back off and then rise again. But it's really hard to make make very big predictions and proclamations, but I do think we are heading into a different world. So on one hand, in terms of how you manage a portfolio today, I, I think you have to be, I, I think that the market's going to be tough for the next six months. If I had to guess between the midterm elections and the fact that the Fed has to play catch up. Um, uh, but I don't think that this necessarily means that it's the end by any stretch, if anything, it's an opportunity. I think you should look at it like that, that uh, that the prices come off. You know, the economy is still growing. The world is still spinning. Um, we'll be okay. I don't, I don't think it's, but I do think that as we go further out, I think we're going to, that the, what's worked before uh, is not going to work in the future. So it's going two years from now. I think you're going you're gonna to have to find alternatives and, there are alternatives. I mean, cash. What, what are the old? You mentioned that before. What are the alternatives? Well, I, I think you know, running a sensible equity portfolio and not trying to guess if this is. A lot of people say, "Oh, the market looks so high. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous." Or stop trying to guess. Yes, I mean, you can. There are times when the market gets uh, excessive, and then, then at times when it gets oversold. So, and and you have a choice to. I wouldn't. I think for investors, stop trying to worry about whether where we are in that, because it's really hard to know. The problem is you might get one side right, but you get the other side wrong. So in general, is just ride it. Be in a position that allow yourself to ride. And that's what we try to do. We build portfolios. We build, our portfolio is, is it, it, it can weather those storms and we can sail through. And that's, you know, that's the first one of the main parts of it. And it's specifically when we're talking about alternatives to bonds, um, conventional bonds, you know, they're now you're yielding negative one percent plus on the ten year. Why would you want to hold that? It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, it, it, you're losing money right off the bat. So this conception that we have, where bonds, it's easy. They throw off a five six percent yield. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to worry about them. And then they protect us when the markets fall, when the equities fall. That's no longer the case. And I don't think that's going to be the case in the future. So the alternatives are equities. You can hold some cash. I think having some some strategy that allows you to have treasury inflation protected securities 
but it's not that simple. You have to be able to put together a strategy. There's a certain level of expertise that's involved in that beyond even what I do. I mean, it's so, you know, for me, it's finding guys, who, and I know people who do that. So we incorporate in that in our strategy. Um, finding, I think, real assets in an inflationary world will do better, meaning real assets have a lot of it's real estate or real or, or real estate uh, investment trusts that are listed in the market. You can get access that way. Uh, infrastructure. Uh, 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 funds uh, they're sort of uh, they could be uh, resource related commodities uh, timber uh, uh, energy related things that in, in an inflationary environment tend to be better than a lot of the alternatives out there um, and, and the list goes on so you uh, so anything that that is is uncorrelated to conventional bonds and and ideally uncorrelated to equities that's that's the sort of direction that I think people should be should be looking, and it's definitely the way we're going. We're, we, even for ourselves, we you know we have a certain expertise. We manage our equity portfolio. We're we're, we're pretty competent at that. We've been doing it for a long time, um, but we are also looking to expand beyond that because we see that that the future again. I don't you know nobody knows exactly how it's going to pan out, but I think that that it's a the, it, we are in a regime change. And I think a lot of people don't really uh, are not ready for it yet. And they're, unfortunately, it's going to be a rude awakening. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, let, can we talk, just break down a little bit of that. Uh, so you talked about uh, first, first, what about precious metals? What about gold? Um, is, is gold something that falls within that category of alternatives? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a lot of alternatives. My point is just there's a lot of alternatives out there. We own gold. We've owned gold forever. Uh, it's I hate it, you know, it, it, but, you know, we had a lot of it in 2020 when the markets collapsed. You know, that was that really helped our portfolio. It's, it's that for me, it's it's that hedge, that safety mechanism that, that gold plays. It's, uh, you know, there's no there's no there's very little unless you the gold miners have some cash flow attached to it but basically it doesn't generate any cash it's just a you know it's, it's a store of value and historically you know it's it's useful so i would say in and in, in, in there's debate on this but in, depending on what kind of inflationary world it should probably do better than a lot of the alternatives out there so, so the huh. answer is yes precious metals gold in particular absolutely i think having an allocation makes sense you uh, you mentioned utilities or energy rather energy and I I wanted to ask you about that. We had a show a couple of days ago with a, an energy guy out of Florida, and um, he you know he's talking about um, you know the consolidation of the industry. He's talking about um, you know the increase in demand for energy because you know we have a lot of appliances and computers and stuff that requires energy. We have new technologies coming online, and although uh, you know renewables are not you know at a point now. Just yet, we're going to say they're you know, driving the whole thing. Um, they're they're definitely in the future, and so um, utilities are not an old lady stock anymore. Uh, utilities uh, can be very exciting, and you mentioned utilities. Although I would say, uh, see if you agree that utilities to look at utilities really requires a certain amount of expertise because of all the moving parts in utilities these days uh so what are those level what are those uh, areas of expertise and uh, what considerations enter into what part of the energy world you buy into so that th th there's there's a number of related pieces to that i mean, utilities I, I you have to be careful with utilities because they they are quasi uh, fixed income. So if, if if rates are going up, then that's not that's not usually not great for utilities. So I, I don't I'm not uh, I'm probably bearish on utilities per se. However, there are some utilities out there that are making the switch to renewable, and that's pretty exciting. But the multiples that they trade on right now is too high. Um, so which brings to another point, and it relates to energy. Uh, when I think we're at our belief is we are at a point where both for bonds and for equities, uh, this is a time to increase exposure to what we call short duration assets as opposed to long duration, because long duration is more sensitive to changes in interest rates, particularly when they're going up. So an example of a long duration asset would be the, the 10 or 20 year bond or uh high tech stocks that don't have that trade it they can be great stocks or they can be 
stocks that have no profit um, and they trade at high multiples. So those would be long duration. Short duration would be stocks that have uh, perhaps lower quality companies. And, and there's a, the way to define that is uh, and a lot of energy companies are those type of lower quality companies uh, that are cheap and they trade at lower valuations. And so that's kind of how we reposition the portfolio a bit. You know, we, um, we don't like to switch strategies midstream and we don't, we prefer not to rent stocks. We prefer to own them forever as we don't want to sell them. But if you own a, a short duration asset, you're probably going to have to sell it at some point. So we don't personally have too many, but the way the world is going to your point about talking in, 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 with energy, as we transition, and we've had this view for a while, but as you transition from dirty or, you know, dirty energy to clean energy, it's not that simple. And it actually, what's happened, it's created more demand for legacy energy. And so that's why you're seeing prices go up. And that's why you're seeing, even in Germany today with Ukraine, I mean, they're shutting down all their nuclear energy plants. And we've been long uranium uh, for, uh, for many years now, a mm. number of years, um, on that belief that that transition is going to be very important for that we we're going to rely even more on the older energy companies. So those are shorter duration assets that are that are cheap, that they're they're throwing off a ton of free cash flow right now. You know, and the returns are, you know, over the short term going to be very impressive. So, I mean, I think yeah, we, we I would love to own some of those renewable energy stocks, but I'm going to wait for them to trade at reasonable prices as, as with a lot of the high quality tech stocks, you know, it, it, we do a lot of the, we do a lot of work trying to analyze where we think fair value is. And it's, that's, it's really hard to do, but there's, there are a number of ways you can calculate that. Our focus is on price to free cash flow in particular. And that's why when we look at the markets like this, we actually get excited because this means we're going to be able to buy great companies uh, and we're going to be able to get them at a reasonable price. Yeah, yeah, price. Yeah. And, and the the math on that is lost on a lot of people, but it, it's that, that power of, of incrementally getting a better price and what it does for your ultimate returns is so significant if, if what you're looking to do is really have your uh, get boost your returns and then let them compound is really the key. The key to that is just don't touch it, you know, let it, let it compound because those companies, they, you know, if they're good, they'll take that free cash flow and they'll reinvest it in the right way and get a better return better than we can ever do. That's why we give them the money. Yeah. So um, you're an international guy. Uh, you spent plenty of time in Asia and, and you lived in Taiwan, even though, even though you don't speak Thai. <laughs> I don't speak Thai. I speak three dialects of Chinese. Um, I'm remembering a, a talk you gave where you right, helped me right. understand that nobody in Taiwan speaks Thai. Yeah, no, I think it was, I was in China and they, they kicked me out or they told me I had to leave. And this is this is 35 plus years ago. And uh, yeah, no, I uh, they, they said that. Well, I said, I, but I want to learn Chinese. And, and they, they said, well, you can go to Taiwan. I said, I don't want to learn Thai. Um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, I spent, I spent 30 some odd years in China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Uh, so I want to ask you about, you know, the international basket, if you will. Sure. Now, um, there's plenty of stress in the world, uh, plenty of, um, you know, strange doings, if you will, and, and risky, threatening doings uh, without, you know, going into detail on Ukraine or Taiwan, for that matter. And I wonder how you feel about international issues right now. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I you know, was reading a, a, a book by um, uh, you were the, the Israeli historian philosopher, um, Yuri Oh, uh, I can't remember his name. Though. Yuval. Yeah, yeah. Another Thank guy. You. He's a fabulous guy. Fantastic. And he, one of his, I'm paraphrasing, but the, 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 um, you know, we're all afraid of change, most of us, and we fear it. And, but historically speaking, the one constant that, that we have is change. And so we are going through a period of change. Okay. You know, this is what's going on, it, whether it's China or Russia, United States, domestically, all these things, e even with the, the pandemics. And it's, you know, often around pandemics, we have these sort of shifts. So it doesn't mean change is bad and change is good. It's just change. And there will be challenges. There'll be some great things that come out of it and some horrible things. So 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, as it, re- so I think we are seeing that now and China is obviously, and Russia, but China in particular, um, is, uh, it, they are uh, expanding and, and and from a historical point of view, they they are, are uh, in the process of reverting to their mean of where they were for the for, for, for thousands of years. You know, and I'm not exaggerating. They they were the ultimate power. And so it, it's uh that is somewhat not a surprise. And I don't think anybody should be shocked by that. Uh what it means for the world order is, you know, who knows? I mean, is there'll be a, there'll be competition and there'll be challenges. It's 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 um you know, I still have my money on the United States. Uh, I, I, I think we have a phenomenal system as messed up as it is, um, and, and change is needed here as well. Um, but, you know, China is, is, a, is a formidable competitor, and they will be, and we're just going to have to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, having said that, I think they are a very fragile place, and I think I've talked through a couple of uh, conversations we've had through ThinkTech. Um, on China, it is, you know, it is, I, I, I admire them and yet I, I worry about, them. I mean, what they've done with COVID, they painted themselves into a corner and that's affected their economy. And it's going to be interesting how they extricate themselves. Will they, will they get out of it? More than likely they'll figure it out, uh, but there could be some challenges along the way. And, and we invest, you know, globally. So that's, you know, we, we, we pay attention to these things. Um, we think that one of the things from an investment point of view is it's probably not a bad time to be looking at uh, or thinking about allocating a bit more uh, of money to some of the inter- you know outside of the United States. United States has a, and, and the U.S. has a great run, and it's still going to be the most it's still the most innovative place on the planet. So I'm not I'm not you get a lot of people come on talking heads. Smart, famous people. Um, one, 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 one gentleman who I know was on recently on on the uh, uh, Bloomberg, and, and uh, it, it, they make these massive proclamations, and I think it's not helpful. They may be right, but you know, they, they, you know, eventually, it's that thing. You know, a clock is is right. You know, twice a day or whatever it is. You know, you know a broken clock. Um, uh, yeah, so it, 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 there's an element of that. I, 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 and and but I do think internationally, I think that there are some opportunities. I think China over, uh, I think once they get themselves out of this sort of COVID issue, I think you know th- there's going to be opportunities there. What about impact investments? You know, there are, there are people around who would like to direct their investments to mm, high high moral, high principle companies. Is that is that relevant now? I, I think it's relevant more from a moral philosophical sense. I, I I'm I'm actually you know we get we get really excited about these trends, and this is a massive trend. I mean, it, it, economically or, or commercially, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm skeptical about the actual results. Uh, Person and and I and there was an article not too long ago, I think this week in the Wall Street Journal or, or in Bloomberg, I can't remember, talking about this that 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 the evidence is not there yet that it that it's actually a sensible from from a, from a returns point of view way to invest, but but ethically, obviously, it makes a lot of sense. But I think a lot of people are jumping on it and running around saying, "Yes, we are," and so oh, we want to do you know the, 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 it makes them feel good. Whether it actually makes a difference, you know, or not, I I don't know. I I, I, I and so we uh, you know just from talking our own book. We don't pay as much attention to it. We probably should if we wanted to raise more assets. We're sensitive to it. We're open to it. But I, I, I'm a bit skeptical, that person. Mm. Okay, one last important area I want to cover with you is, is optics. You know, we have um, a good part of the press in this country is 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 is, is calling us in a crisis, in a, a crisis of a democracy, in a crisis over government in general, a crisis over the social safety net, the success or failure of the administration. Um, you know, there's a lot of threatening and climate change. Don't forget climate change. There's all these things happen and they're all pretty threatening. And a lot of the press um, on both sides of the coin, you know, are saying we are we are failing. Um, and a lot of people believe that. Although today I read an article, I forget where it was, to say, now you stop that. Just stop that. Um, because it's not that bad and we'll be okay. So there's two sides to the coin. But bottom line is that a lot of people in this country from various persuasions uh, feel that we are in an emergency situation. 
Um, they feel that the sky, yes, the sky is falling. I mean, and not necessarily in terms of the market, but in terms of the economy, inflation, COVID, you name it. You know, 10 things I could go on. And, and because they feel that way, uh, right or wrong, you know, some of them are right, some of them are wrong, um, you know, they are going to change their investment strategies. They're going to change their consumer strategies. They're going to change their way of feeling about inflation and dealing with inflation and all that. And so, you know, when, when I was a, a young child in college, uh, they taught me in Economics 101 that it was all a matter of public confidence. And if you look at public confidence today, it ain't. So my question is, how come the stock market and all these investment vehicles keep on going up, um, you're reflecting a level of confidence, but you can't find it? You can't find the confidence. Is, am I imagining something? What is happening? What is going on here? So, so, so to unpack that, we, we could spend a, another half an hour just on, on some of those issues alone, uh, you know, in terms of where the country is and some of the, 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 the issues, which, look, I, I'm... You know, when I was comparing, you know, the system is still extremely bullish on the United States because I spent so many years of my life outside of it. But we have some absolutely major, major issues in this country that need to be fixed for sure, uh, and and they're uh, they're fundamental. Um, but you know, you have to have faith and you have to have hope, and you know, that old that old statement that you know the. the uh, what was it? Democracy is the you know is is uh, democracy is the worst system, but it's the best, or something like that. There's the best, you know. There's the best one out there. I, I'm, 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 yeah, yeah. Well, well, we know what you mean. Yeah, you know what Absolutely. I mean. It, it's yeah. still, it's still the best of all the alternatives. It's the worst, but it's still the best of all the alternatives. So, uh, in terms of the markets, though, and in terms of just confidence levels, I think you have to be really careful. We get, we get so influenced by the media, and God knows what else, and we think that confidence. If you're talking about confidence and the markets, I think right there, we need to separate that out because that's not what drives the market. What drives the markets ultimately, like I said earlier, it's it's fundamentals. It's is you know now fun, now confidence will play into the economy, uh, but you've had just to put it in perspective. Uh, yes, I mean consumer confidence. I mean demand is 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 is, is very strong right now, um, but I. I I don't think you can, I think, that, let me step back. The way that people often have, I hear that a lot from people that, oh, you know, confidence is so low and public confidence, in, whether it's in the economy or inflation or the, the government, but that's not what drives the market ultimately. That's uh, I just, it's, it's, it, it is, you know, that's why people say, how could you invest now? Why? I, I don't want to take all my money out of the market. I am not, it's too, that's, it sounds too risky. I'm like that's, that's absolutely not the way, it is a factor that's in there, but it's not. It's not the main thing. I would say, please don't look at that because that I've been I've been doing this for so many years. I can tell you that is not what drives that. Not what determines the level of the stock market. Um, it's uh, if you have if if you have no faith in the economy and you think that things are really going to stop growing, yeah, you know, we have bigger issues. If you if we think that's the case that we've hit as a country or as a world, but as a country specifically. Then I suggest that you should be buying canned food and building your bunker and getting your guns. Because otherwise, it, it is it is kind There's of some people country. doing that. You know, and, and I'm not look. I'm not saying I, I'm always you know come from the old country. It's I'm ready. I'm I, my, it's my mentality is I, I never discount anything. Anything's possible. You know, I just want to be prepared. But at the same time, you can't. You know, you have to. Um, if you if you if you operate with that mentality, you never do anything. Then you you don't actually take those risks, and you. I, I think that th this this country is still going to grow, and growth will equate to uh, higher values in certain assets. And so you need to be exposed to that sensibly and be able to ride the ups and downs inevitably because they absolutely always happen. It doesn't go straight up and doesn't go straight down. It goes all over the place. Um, but over time, as long as that grow, as long as the world is growing or the country's growing and we are, you'll do okay. You'll do okay. The, but the tricky part is inflation. Inflation really makes it, throws a curveball into the equation, the math. Very simple, you know, because it's it's it affects us, uh, you know, uh, it affects prices and everything. Um, and it's it's a 
Yeah, Milton Friedman said it's inflation is a is a uh, everywhere and and all the time a monetary uh, phenomenon. It's actually more of a behavioral uh, and uh, psychological uh, 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 thing, and that's why it, it's not going away. It's out of the bottle. We got That's going to be the challenge. You ask me what I'm worried about is how do we deal with inflation? How do we deal with the type of uh, debt that we have as a country. How does that play out? And, and it's going to be really interesting how that, you know, there are going to be the tough choices that are going to be in front of us, not necessarily for you and me, Jay, but for, you know, the, 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 the kids that are coming up next. Yeah. They're going to have to pay our bills is what's going to happen. But you know, you're not, you're not worried about the need to uh, uh, take a wheelbarrow of Deutschmarks or Zlotties uh, down to the grocery store for no. a loaf of bread. No, I, but but that, that is but you have to as a student of history you have to recognize that's what I'm a, that that is the ultimate fear because that's that's how you get World War II that's how you get the Nazis that's how you get all sorts of pro- throughout history I mean this is hyperinflation and and I'm not suggesting that that's going to happen I think we're going to have inflation but I think it's going to be waves of inflation where up and then down and up and down and um, I don't think it's going to I think we we're we, we understand it enough. We have the tools at this point, and I think we have the, the willingness, you know, the, the ability, um, the sensibility to use those tools to basically moderate the effects of that. But I think once it's out there, like I said, that's the thing about this monetary, and it's, it's, it's there. It's going to be very tough to put back into the bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't mean you go out and you just, you know, hold only cash. It, but it does because cash is also going to suffer. This is this is where the from an investment point of view. And so we're, we don't. I don't have all the answers. We continually evolve our strategy and how we approach this. But we use the same basic building blocks and we just add on to them. And I and I think the the ultimate message, you know, beyond the stock market, but just as to your point about the world and the and, and the United States and this divisiveness and this, these changes, you know, you got to have faith and you got to have hope. I mean, you got to recognize how bad it is, but just you can't lose that because that's the stuff that ultimately gets us through it. Yeah, and you got to observe. You got to be alive and and sentient and follow the action. Whatever you wind up doing, at least you have to be um, in in contact and, and, a, and a good um, consumer of better news. Yeah. You know? Well, Richard, I I, um, I I'm sorry we 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 can't have a a meal in person. Uh, but we, as I said before the show, we could share a virtual pizza. And uh, if if you or I go out and buy a lot of canned food, uh, then uh, we could do a canned food virtual lunch, if you will. I, I prefer I prefer pizza. And if you get it from New York, that would be even better. There you go, <laughs> Richard Wertheim. Mean, what is your website so people will know what, what it looks like? Uh, it is Wert Street AM Asset Management dot com. All right. Richard Wertheimer, it's so nice to know you, so nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Jay, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Aloha.